Hi, I'm Carrie Schmidt, and this is Making Sense, a podcast produced by the Star Institute in an effort to further our commitment to impacting quality of life by developing and promoting best practices for sensory health and wellness through treatment, education, and research. This season is sponsored by our community partner, Summit Sensory Gym. Have you ever wondered if there's a way to amplify a child's therapy experience? Well, Summit Sensory Gym is the answer you were looking for. Summit Sensory Integration Therapy Gyms have been shown to be an invaluable tool for parents and therapy providers looking to give their children the best possible care. The benefits of sensory integration therapy gyms are numerous. They provide a safe and stimulating environment for children to explore and develop their motor, language, and social skills in a fun and engaging way. Through this type of therapeutic play, children can learn how to better regulate their emotions and respond to different sensory stimuli. Visit summitsensory.com to learn more and schedule your free design consult. I'm joined today by Jared and Maria Tipton. Jared and Maria are the first um, couple and parents that we've had on the podcast. So I would invite you guys to tell us a little bit about yourselves, um, your meaningful occupations, who you are, what you do in the world, and um, who your family is. I'm Maria Tipton, and I am a military spouse. I am a mom of two amazing boys. Um, They're seven and nine. And um, I am also a corporate attorney. Um, I also uh, volunteer as uh, president of the board of directors at Star Institute, which is a passion of mine. Um, As you mentioned, my name is Jared Tipton, but uh, yeah, I'm a career military professional. Um, And so, you know, I guess ever since I left high school, I guess you could say my life is a life of service, um, both uh, our country as well as my family. Um, and uh, that's what my primary energies and devotion is to. Well, thank you so much for your service. So Maria, you and I connected at the STAR Symposium. Um, Mm -hmm. We were connecting and talking a little bit about some of the ways that the presentations had resonated with us and your perspective as the president of our board, but also a parent to me with such a unique perspective. And so we decided to regroup and record a conversation where you could talk about maybe your journey to connecting with STAR and a little bit about your family and your personal experience with sensory processing. Okay, so we started our journey in um, August of 2016 when my oldest um, son um, was ha- had a limited uh, verbal vocabulary, I would say. And so we were seeking speech therapy. And in the course of that, uh, we referred to occupational therapy as well. And so that kind of opened up a whole new world. I had never heard, I've heard of occupational therapy, but never experienced it, especially on a pediatric level. And so um, I think back in 2016, when we received diagnosis, um, you know, you hear it was very deficit language, um, it, you know, as developmental, significant developmental delay. And at that point, I saw myself as a mom and an attorney by trade. And so I would take him to therapy three times a week. We, we had amazing therapists, but it was an approach where I had the therapist take him and do the therapy. And then I came home um, and I wasn't um, really involved. Um, we then subsequently had a, a military move and um, had to set all of that up again. And we had a lot of trouble finding a right fit for our family and uh, through that course, I found an amazing occupational therapist. I kind of call her like our family OT because she brought me in the sessions, really empowered me as a mother. Um, and Samuel's uh, progression grew exponentially because of that. I started um, taking classes that were for occupational therapists, but as a mother and doing a lot of home carryover with him. And I came across the Star Institute um, 
because of his uh, sensory needs. And it was just always such a resource for me because there were Facebook lives and webinars that I could take. And so I kind of had taken those during that time. And then when we were um, stationed in Georgia, the symposium was there in 2018. And I was like, I really want to go, like, I want to go to the parent seminar. I want to go to the the symposium. And so I was able to attend. And that was um, really life-changing for me because it, I learned so much from all of the sessions, you know, I, um, at that point, there was a a session on um, interoception, which is something that I hadn't um, heard about before. And, um, you know, just kind of tools uh, and things that I could utilize with our own family. And um, from there, um, I think, you know, everything just kept um, what it's called like a flow. I think like it just continued with him. And um, he is just, you know, just such a uh, well put together nine year old little boy with, you know, um, just really enjoying life. And so that <laughs> kind of long with it is, is our journey. There's, there's more to it in terms of we have a, a second child too that um, because we had gone on this journey with our first, we recognized some, some, some things where he may need some intervention. And so that has, has helped him as well. Jared, from your perspective, um, you are completing your military service, you're probably a, a leader um, in in your roles. And um, Maria is communicating to you that she's a little concerned about your first child. And then she, we, you start down this path. Tell, tell me a little bit about that from your perspective. Um, so when we started this, you know, it's one of those things is that I guess it's different perspectives. Maria picked on it. We had a discussion about it. And I said, yeah, yeah I know you're yeah, you're right. Um, he's, I would think he would be using more words and speaking more. And then I, I thought, okay, I'm not really, you know, at what age does he, does he become more intelligible in terms of when he's talking to his parents and things of that nature. And, you know, I, I do remember, I, I thought it was interesting when he was, uh, we were living here and we were downtown, I think old Colorado city and, uh, you know, a lot of noises and stuff like that. Um, they had a motorcycle that went by and Samuel's response to that, that really caught me off guard because he was just to- totally distraught about it, you know. And then when Maria started piecing all this together, I I, re- I re- remember that situation. I was like, yeah, maybe there's something going on here. And the fact is that just he's getting a lot of inputs and he's just not knowing how to to work with those. Um, I do know, I'll be honest, as as father, I was like, OK. Mental things like, hey, we'll get him, we'll have him see some people and he'll be he'll be fine. Um, and what I realize is it's not a one and done deal here with this. It takes persistence, um, it takes perseverance, um, and uh, acceptance to understand like, hey, my son has is working through this issue, and this is not going to be a quick fix. This is not going to say, hey, sit down with this person for a couple of weeks and do that. No, he's been he's been working through this and he's now nine. And so part of it is just understanding like. It takes work, okay? It takes work on the parent's part. It takes work on the child's part. Um, and also trying to develop that support network for that child. You know, it's funny. As kids, we don't really, we don't, we're, we get very, I guess, narrow views as children. Okay, you have my life. I'm a child. You know, it's all this stuff around me. Um, and they don't really understand. I know when he gets older, he'll understand about how much work he had to put in. Maria has done a great job with trying to explain to him as he, you know, every year he gets older. Um, hey, this is this is where you were. This is where you're at, uh, where you're at. Um, and this is the work you still need to put in um, so that we can kind of like, I guess, normalize that with him um, and also allow him to accept that. You know, my biggest fear is you always your biggest fear is your child struggling. And that was my biggest concern when she first. Uh, we first start talking about it because nobody wants your child to struggle. Um you know, I'll be honest, my first response was it broke my heart um, and I was worried and um, about him and um, fearful. I was like, how are, how are we going to get through all this stuff? And I, I had to give it to my wife. I'll be honest, you know, with the military is very demanding. Um, she put all her time and effort into chasing everything down. First, I want to say, say thank you for sharing that, because I think from a parent's perspective, 
the last thing you want is for your child to struggle. A little bit about how you carried that forward. Like Maria was telling me, Jared, that like as a leader now, you have given a hand up to people behind you to say like, it's okay if your child struggles, you can set up these services. Um, And it sounds like Maria, you also have modeled that for other moms, maybe in your situation, like this is how you set up services in the context of the military or in the context of a military move. Yeah, I've, you know, being in positions with uh, with uh, co-workers and, you know, in the military, very tight community and, and you share things. And, um, you know, I've had members share things and like the struggles and stuff like that. And I'm like, I was better able to relate to that situation with those those members that come and talk to me about that. And I was, I mean, unfortunately, I was always like, hey, we have been through this. Um, and I uh, would always recommend them talk, recommend uh, they talk to my wife. Um, so, you know, and uh, we had one situation in which um, we were able to help someone. And that means a lot. Even if you just help one person, it means a lot that we're able because I've, we've experienced it. We want to share your experiences with this individual. And then this is how we um, move down the path. OK, in support and hope and hopefully providing a better life for your child. What I hear is that you as parents said, this is who he is. Mm-hmm. And we love and we accept him and we're going to just do whatever it is to make a great life for him. Yes. Yes, I think yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, when I hear uh, Virginia speak, like, it's just like, oh, I wish that I had these words when this first came on, because I still revert back to, you know, you're going to revert back to the language that you heard at diagnosis. And so sometimes I go back to that, but, you know, I've, in, in talks, you know, she calls it asynchronous development. You know, everybody one everybody develops differently, um, but it was it was such a significant delay in our case that it caused problems just with daily life, and that's not always the case. But I think part of it also is removing that stigma of seeking services because there's there are people and professionals out there that can help get that to where a a child feels comfortable. Basically, I always just say, are they comfortable in their body? Because that may mean many different things, but if they're uncomfortable, we were experiencing meltdowns multiple times a day, not being able to participate in, um, you know, play, um, you know, the occupations of childhood in in, in an enjoyable manner. And so um, I've always been very open about um, our journey. And, um, I think because I don't want, there shouldn't be a stigma associated with it. And sometimes it feels that way, maybe, especially when you're a first time parent and you've never really experienced like the, this world maybe, um, where you need additional services. And so that's why I've always shared it. Like in, in groups, I'm, I'm in with other, other parents and even within the military. And sometimes when you're starting it, it feels really lonely because you're like, what do I even do? Like, where do I, where's step one? Um, And it felt that way for me when I first started. And I was very fortunate to meet several people that helped me along the way. And I just kind of want to pass that on as well. Yeah, as you say, a lot of this, what there's specific instances that brought this all home to me. Um, I got home from work and uh, our son was just having, he was having a rough day. He's had a complete meltdown. And I had to go down and I had to get down on his level and hold him and put my arms around him because he was, nothing was working and he was upset and he, you could tell he was angry. And, and the, it, uh, and I put my arms around him and just held him and he's struggling. And uh, so that, uh, that brings it home to you. It also, and as I mentioned, it reinforces your commitment to your child. So um, it also helped me to kind of put my sh- myself in his shoes to understand what he's going through because he's just he doesn't know how to communicate at that point. And um, it's the frustration. I could feel the frustration from him. And so a um, bit of a bonding experience, but also it, it brought it home to me as well. And that's beautiful. And it's something that, you know, at the Star Institute, we place a super high value on on parent coaching. And at the very beginning, it's like, just join them. Just join them where they are, get on the floor, right? Just look in their eyes and and tell them you understand, right? That you're you're here and that you're not afraid of whatever their big emotion is. 
and you wrap your arms around them and you're with them. And so that's such a beautiful example. I think that will hit home with a lot of parents who maybe have a child that they're not sure what's going on, but they're seeing some concerning signs, whether it's big behaviors or maybe it's even um, meltdowns. So talk to talk to those parents a little bit about what are some of the things that, like Jared's example of getting on the floor, what are some of the things that maybe are your go-tos or s- even some different way that you think about the big reaction to the motorcycle, the meltdowns, the frustration that builds in your children. If you have any tools, any tips, any hints, any resources that you turn to when you have those experiences as parents. You know, I think when you have that, and if you haven't already, I always say, you know, get an evaluation from a qualified occupational therapist because every child's makeup and sensory needs are different and they can let you know if this is uh, something where they may need intervention and they can help develop a sensory diet. But really it is the sensory diet. I mean, that a child may need like one, you know, one of our children really loves swinging a lot, like in, in big gross motor, um, whereas our other may need you know, some quiet time and like lights out and just kind of reading in a little nook, like, you know, um, and, and the other, like going back and forth in a body sock and like, you know, and, um, and so I think that each child is, is so, is so different, but once you get to really understand their needs, um, then you just make that part of daily life. I think when we were back, when we were having the big meltdowns and things, a lot of the sensory diet stuff wasn't really, we weren't really, we didn't really know. Um, but we did know that we could just like co-regulate, like give them whatever, you know, your child likes, like some children may not like to be hugged, but if they do give them a big hug, or, you know, if you don't have that sensory diet developed yet, like we hadn't at that time, what do they, what, uh, comforts them and, and do that and then seek the professional, um, assistance. I love the message of like, know your child and find out what works for them. Like there was something in you, Jared, that knew that your son needed you to get on the floor with him. Yeah, that was a basic situation. Cause I was like, what do I do here? And my fallback was just hold him. Just put your arms around them, okay? Um, and uh, and one, it, one, it is to show you care and also to show that as a parent, you're relating to them and they're not alone. That's my biggest fear is that he's going through this singular, in his mind, a singular s- situation with multiple inputs going on. And I'm like, what is the one thing I can do? And the, I went for the simplest thing. And uh it, I know it calmed him down, but it also, it pulled me into the situation. I'll be honest, it kind of spurred, it spurred my journey. It really did. Um, that's when I, you know, you kind of like, you get complete buy-in on this and the success of your child. And also with all the, um, meeting all the needs they may have at that time. I think that brings um, up an interesting topic, and that is that sometimes one parent disproportionately experiences some of the the fallout from sensory processing differences. So um, the other parent comes in and feels like, I don't know what to do, and I'm not as experienced here. Um, And so the the importance of of communicating and of the buy-in of both parents to support the progress to be okay with not knowing, but just kind of jumping in and saying, what can I do? True. It's also open mind. I'll be honest. Maria had brought, when we were going through this process with her sons, uh, Maria brought a lot of things to me. And what I realized is that I had to, um, trying to think the right term, I had to check my own biases. Okay. Everybody has their own biases about certain things. And some things you don't know, you don't really notice. Um, I think the term they use, metacognition. Um, and that's where you realize, okay, hey, what are my biases? I become more of a person to recognize that because Maria brings stuff. I was like, are you sure we really need to do that? I don't know about that, you know. So what it did, it did, it did drive me to have more of an open mind, and then to also think about, okay, why why am I not so supportive of this one 
therapy or this one thing that needs to happen or something like this, or this additional diagnosis that's been added on top of all these other diagnoses um, is to keep an open mind um, and to uh, realize that any effort you make is only for the benefit of the child. That's really lovely. Jared, I know you have to go because you're working midnights. And so you're so gracious to be here before you go to go to work tonight. But one of the questions that I always ask at the end of the podcast, and I'd love to get your answer before you have to go, um, is that we place such a high value on curiosity at STAR that as the science evolves and as we learn new things, a lot of times we have to um, admit our humility <laughs> that we don't know everything, but that we're willing to learn. And it means sometimes we have to change our minds. And so what's something that you maybe once thought or believed that you've changed your mind about? Um, mine was, and I kind of mentioned it uh, earlier, was that, hey, this is a, this would be a quick fix. It's not a quick fix. Mine was like, okay, we'll just do this. We'll do, maybe we'll do this for a couple of months and then they'll be, you know, right as rain and everything. That's not true. Um, I had opened my mind that just, again, is this is a, it's a progress, it's progress and it's a journey and that you must share that journey with your child um, for them to be the most successful um, down the road. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, and Marie and I, I think we're going to continue talking, but it does sound like, um, as you mentioned earlier, that you have gone on a journey towards joy and that you see in your son's um, that they're living full and joyful lives. Um, and so I just want to, you know, just compliment that humility that you answered that question with and that you've lived that, to honor that you've lived that. Thank you very much. And I appreciate you providing the time for us to talk. Yes, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Let's jump back in. I want to make sure that we come full circle with recognizing your son had significant speech delays. Um, you started on the path of getting therapeutic intervention, but I'd love to make sure we capture a little bit about not just the resources that you were able to collect and build a team around him, but how he's doing, yes. um, you know, what, what, what does that look like and how successful he is now. One thing I failed to mention is we did have a developmental pediatrician on our initial visit and she interviewed Jared and I and said, okay, um, you know, Samuel is a child that he's going to be a teenager. And I know you guys as parents, because we had had like a two hour, you know, meeting or whatever the you know, medical appointment. She's like, he's going to not even know there was anything at that point. You're like, what is like, I don't, I'm just learning everything. And it's really hard. Like it was hard to see him struggle, but we're, I feel like we're there. Um, and we're there early. Um, but it is definitely, um, possible with, you know, to, to basically every child's journey is going to be different. And I just wanted um, my children to feel comfortable in their body, to be able to, attend to their daily life. Um, but what happened was a uh, pretty success, success, success. <laughs> I'm not saying a word, right. But he, uh, was, you know, he was meeting OT goals in a year goal or six, a uh, year goals in six months. And then he was dismissed from his IEP. Um, and that freed up to where we could send him to school. And that was also just like, that was one of the big moments where like, um, we knew his, um, his uh, development was coming to a point where, um, he was progressing. Um, and then really, I think within the past two years, it has, uh, he's just, he's just him himself. Like he knows what he likes. Um, he feels comfortable. He makes, friends, very easy, like very social. Like that was one of the things, um, at the very beginning that we were always so concerned about. And then like, when he started kindergarten, I like walked in school, like maybe three months later at a Halloween party. And like Samuel was saying hi to like a third and fourth grader. Like I was like, here's this child. Like I was so happy, but it was also like, um, this exponentially kind of more, but I also think that it makes those little things like so much more special because I know like all the steps he had to take to be able to be that, that, that person, you know, like he, um, 
he's just comfortable in his body. That's what I always say, but he's very confident and, um, yeah, uh, I couldn't be happier. You know, I did have to step away from my career for a few years because we wanted to do intensive intervention and I knew I would go back and I was able to. And I think that's also another like sign, like he, like my children are, are, are great. They can attend to daily life and I don't, I don't need to, um, take them to therapy and be able to do that, like carry over every day that we were doing. Yeah, that's so important to bring up too. I think like for parents listening, take us a little bit more on the trajectory of um, three years old, does not have the speech and language, some red flags are going up. Is that the time that you see the developmental pediatrician? Yes. Um, And we hadn't recognized sensory. Honestly, it was a a great thing that we went for speech um, and then that uh, therapy place had an occupational therapist. So it was like, let me take him <laughs> do an evaluation. Right, which is something parents might pick up on because sometimes I think speech um, in the early intervention model can be the thing that brings families to therapeutic intervention um, because the milestones can be pretty concrete and practitioners can, um, whether you take them to the pediatrician, the developmental pediatrician, a nurse practitioner, a lot of times the questions around speech can be pretty clearly yes or no. And so that can be your entry point into therapy. And then the speech language pathologist can say, hmm, you know, I think maybe we could use an occupational therapy opinion. Yes. Sometimes I think they could be the professionals that say, have you seen a developmental pediatrician? And we had an amazing pediatrician at that time who said, hey, let's go ahead and get you on the schedule for a developmental pediatrician. Um, and so luckily there was one in the area that didn't have a two-year wait. A lot of pe- a lot of places you can't even find one, right? Um, and so um, we went through that process. And um, we always, and I think it was a good point that one of our one of our caregivers said, and I just kind of loved it. And she was just like, Samuel is Samuel, like, it doesn't matter what a diagnosis or label is, like, and I was like, that's true, like, that, we wanted the diagnosis for insurance, like, and that never defined our son, um, or either one of our sons, and it's hard to, like, say that, oh, this is a diagnosis or whatever, but that, it doesn't matter what's on paper, that's just for the professional medical community, and it's for insurance purposes, it, got us the insurance coverage that we needed to do intensive therapy. And I think that that's important for parents to kind of like, if you can wrap your mind around that, like that's a label that is given based on a set of criteria, but your child is so much more than that set of criteria. Thank you for saying that. Cause I think the diagnosis piece can be very hard and very emotional for parents. And so I love the way you said, you know, Samuel is Samuel, their child is their child. If the diagnosis can get your child the services they need to live a fuller life, to live a more joyful life, then as a parent, use them, right? Like use that to get the services that your child needs, but don't get too hung up on the label. Yep, exactly. I would agree. Um, You know, um, I think another point I kind of wanted to make too is that like, you know, it, it takes it takes a while, like you're going to get evaluations. And every time you like, I had, unfortunately, (laughs) fortunately, and unfortunately, like the military is great. That's our life. But the unfortunate part is that I have to fill out that paperwork so many times I had to fill it out. And it's very disheartening to have to list the negative qualities when you know that that's not really what you want to see your child as. Like, I always loved the question, like, um, like what's a unique attribute of your child or what do you um, like about them the most, but then you have to list all this other stuff and then you get evaluations every six months to a year um, for the insurance and it like has all this negative things in it. And that was always hard for me, like to get every time I read through those. Um, so yeah, thanks for saying that. Cause I think that's um, also something practitioners can take away that we are sending out paperwork and, you know, using that paperwork to inform what evaluation tools we might want to use, 
But it's really, really important to make sure that we're using strengths-based language in our evaluation, in our parent report measures, um, in our interview of the parents as well, not to only use deficit language or only use deficit metrics. Um, and when you and I spoke around the time of symposium, one of the things we were talking about is how, um, how important it is to, on the front page of the evaluation, capture some of the most wonderful, unique things about the child because the parents are faced with reading reports, maybe annually, maybe every six months, um, that hopefully are capturing progress, but also use deficit-based metrics. And so if we could make sure that we're capturing who that child is, what makes them unique, what strengths they have that are gonna support progress, how much easier that report is for you as a parent to digest. Absolutely. Um, you know, and uh, the flip side is we also have a gifted, he's gifted. So like we see so much of that shine, like shine um, to that. There's other things that go along with being gifted, but um, you know, like um, there's, we're, we're all, um, I guess it's, uh, let's see, we're all neurodiverse. And so that's something that I learned during this process. Like, you know, what is normal? There's, everybody has different qualities about them. And so um, we're not going to fit, um, no one fits a mold. Um, and it's like those, those unique attributes that you really, um, like find those, even if it's like a really hard time, like, what is it that is so unique? Like when he was really young, it was just like, he's so, like, so lovable. Like now I love his love of learning. Like he's, uh, he takes it to a different level and different things. Like he knows every country and I'm like, okay, I didn't, I'm sad to admit, like, I don't know that country, <laughs> like, um, <laughs> like little small ones, you know, not, not big ones, but that's so great. So, you know, to hear even that end of the spectrum where he was unable to even communicate with you for a while, you got involved with intervention and developmental pediatrician said, just wait, just wait, he's gonna wow you, right? Like wait till he's a teenager, he won't even know what you've done because he's gonna, he's gonna be okay. And that message of hope. And now you're telling me he not only learned to communicate, but he is um, identified as gifted. So he was able to communicate enough to even complete assessments that we're capturing his intellectual strengths as well. And so there's so much hope there um, for parents who are in the trenches and worried, will they ever speak? Will they ever communicate? Um, will we ever find that special interest, like knowing every country in the world? <laughs> And, you know, and I, I do want to speak to you because I have a, I have a nephew, um, who is autistic and he, um, he communicates in a different way. He's not verbal. Um, he, he can communicate with his parents very well. Um, but his, um, you know, his trajectory will be totally different. So I also want to say like, I'm, I'm very grateful Samuel developed to who he is, but even had, like, if he was if he was made to be different than that, I would, we would have accepted that. And don't like, um, I, I just don't want parents to think, oh, everything's will maybe be like what you may personally picture, like as what would be like the end goal, like, you know, meet them where they are and then like just recognize and like celebrate. Like we used to do little celebrations for like meeting different things that he, he wanted to do. And it, it that's going to look different. The end is going to look different for every um, family. And um, our son also has a praxis of speech and it is amazing that he is where he's at. Most people would never know. And like, sometimes people will say, do you think he needs some speech therapy? And I'm kind of, wanna be, well, we've been in speech therapy for six years. And um, I'm also now that he is nine, I, we are, we have a lot more open conversations. And because he's in a school setting, you know, kids may bully because of based on how speech is. Um, it's not, um, you know, it, it's not as 
uh, as conversational as maybe me like talking, you know, like there's still R's, there's other things, but I kind of tell him, I say, well, I mean, I have a proxy of speech. Everybody has challenges and I've worked really hard. So what's your problem? Like just to advocate for himself. And I, I really hope that that like all, all kids can do that and be like, Hey, this is what's going on with me. And, you know, be comfortable with where they are. Um, I love that. That. We were talked earlier about like, Oh, how do we capture and highlight their strengths? And you're even saying like, doesn't communication is what was important to you. And for your nephew, it's nonverbal, but he's bonded and communicating really well with and communicating his wants, his needs and things to the people that love him. And just as you celebrate your son's accomplishments, because he's worked so hard on his individual accomplishments, you know him well enough to know he worked really hard at that. I'm going to celebrate it it's not always going to look the same for every child, what that accomplishment is to your point. Like we have expectations and it's going to look this way and then this is going to happen. And then this is going to happen, but to stop and just be in awe of what they accomplish. It can be the smallest thing that nobody else would even notice, but you noticed, Oh my gosh, he just said hello to kids that are like three and four years older than him. Like that's a huge accomplishment for him. Um, You know, nobody knows the work that went into that. So to know your child, to celebrate every little thing that you can, that they worked really hard for. I I think that um, we tell them you've worked really hard. So you can, you had to work really hard to do some things that just others take for granted. So like, remember that and you can do whatever you want to do. Yeah, I like that. And it sounds like at this age, there's even an opportunity for some agency around that. Like, what work do you want to do? Like, what are you wanting to focus on right now? Um, If you wanted to get back into intervention, if you wanted to take a break from intervention, trying to follow their lead a little bit, tell me a little bit about how that developed um, for your family. Um, so we, uh, we graduate, like graduated, um, our oldest from therapy when we moved back to the Springs in 2019 and, um, took a break from that. And, um, then we did like a refresher, like the, um, like basically a little after COVID hit and ended that. And then we let him decide to end that. And he's, we're going to be good with it until he says he wants to maybe if he ever feels that he needs it, um, and then with, in terms of like speech, we did take a, a, a break and he may restart it like in the near future, but we're going to also let him decide um, and take ownership of like, do you think that you um, want to go to speech therapy or are you, are, do you think that you're, you're good where you're at? Like he's done it for so long that um, he gets to make that decision. Um, with our, our youngest, he does, uh, he does have, um, occupational therapy once a week. And, um, we set up a whole sensory gym for them. So I feel like, you know, they're good. They like, they go to school, but they can come home and do their, whatever they want in that, that sensory gym with their like swings. And, um, you know, I mean, it's kind of like when you start to get into it, like every child like this, like, you know, they have, have all these fun things. Like, I'm like, I definitely didn't have that, but they're able to to meet whatever needs they may have. And now, um, uh, I think our youngest will probably say like, give another six months and then he'll be fine to just, you know, um, kind of progress out of therapy. Tell us more about your sensory gym. Like if parents are curious about that, um, how did you start setting that up? And like, what did you just kind of follow what you knew was good for them? You mentioned like one of your sons loves to swing, you mentioned that another one kind of likes um, like a body sock or some, you know, restricted kind of pushing and pulling kind of movement. So tell us a little bit about what you have in your gym and um, kind of how that grew. Um, well, when we were in Georgia, we had basically the best PT in the world. <laughs> she was also um, neurodevelopment and SI trained and um, like just had did this for 30 years and had her own um physical therapy clinic. And so she brought me in it with, and like had the boys like use me in part of the therapy or like send me snippets. But a lot of it was her gym. And she was like, I think that he could really benefit from a steamroller. Like my youngest could benefit from a steamroller. And I was like, what is that? And, um, uh, Georgia had, um, family funds available for certain medical equipment that your kids needed, um, which included certain things. And I was like, man, 
we would have really had bought that, but we didn't really kind of know, like, and we, um, like once we had got it, it was such a life changer, but it really was like therapist directed in terms of like, these are things that would really help their bodies. And then, um, so when we moved here, we purchased our house and I was like, I really want to put swing, swings in the ceiling. And I think my husband was like, what? And um, I, I did it. <laughs> Then he was like, okay, this is like really good. Like I got to buy it after I did it and then asked for, uh, you know, for forgiveness later. But um, I started taking, like, I started like looking at online basically at what, what kids used. And then I also asked our therapist, like, what do you think would be good for them? Um, and uh, the military um, had like a, a, a small grant that I was able to use. And then we invested some money in getting like, you know, the mats that they need to have that. And we have two crash pads, um, you know, they, they can run and jump on and then fall out of the swing on. And, um, so and they have a, a few swings they can switch up. Um, and I think like that really, um, has just allowed them to feel really great. We have, we have an occupational therapist that's amazing now, and she comes to our home, so it's really nice to have that. So she teaches us like how to use it with uh, like meet the needs at that point of what's needed. Um, and then it has allowed us to, um, you know, kind of more graduate from like professional therapy, a lot, like a lot of professional therapy. Um, they can just do it on their own now. You mentioned early on that you started recognizing the importance of carryover. And this is like carryover to the nth degree, right? Like if I have this lifestyle and these things in my home, and if I ask my providers, what should I get and how should I use it? That the carryover is really supported and maybe leads to needing less appointments and things like that. Absolutely. And you can do it like, you know, you can make one that that's not um, you know, super elaborate, just have a couple of things that they really need. Um, but I think taking direction from your ther like the therapist and your children, like are, are the two most important pieces to that. I love the evolution too, of the different phases. Like when they first started, you needed to go three times a week, um, until you could build kind of a base of understanding for yourself, what their challenges were and how to carry over. But you've mentioned a couple different things. One is that there was a time when you were going to therapies every day. You mentioned an intensive model. You've mentioned now um, being able to take breaks from therapy, have a therapist come to your home. Like there's all different ways and, and ways that this might happen for other people as well. It might not always look like driving to a therapy clinic five days a week, which is super um, time intensive and finance intensive and um, surely emotionally intensive as well. So talk a little bit about that. Like there's all different types of ways to experience intervention. I'd love for you to talk about the model where you went once or twice a week and then what the difference is between that and like an intensive experience? You know, we did the once or twice a week after we moved back here and um, then Samuel was in full, uh, full-time kindergarten. And um, I think that he was at a point where that was beneficial. Um, and I think the difference is that it, it's not all encompassing um, at that point, like you, and, and you can get the services that you need. I think we did the intensive very early because from what, you know, my research is that, early intervention, like, you know, so much, it pays off in dividends later and you get so much, um, so much benefit from it. And so that's why we did that, uh, when they were so young, I think the two days a week is, is good. Like if you, you know, especially if you have, if you have school age children or, um, you know, um, it also is, is cost and time prohibitive for most people to be able to do that. Like, you know, we decided to take that, like, I'm not going to work. And that took stuff off our, our table in terms of like how we were going to live our lives, but we uh, made that decision, but the two times a week can help so much. And I think that like, there are other, there are therapy clinics that offer like short intensives. So you could maybe like, you know, take a couple of weeks vacation and do that. Um, and then go back to your one to two days a week. Um, 
and then um, going from the one to two days to like just one day is was just kind of like I wanted to make sure that we maintained where we were at and um because we had did so much work I wanted to make sure that was good and then drifting away like with none is that um I think that I have enough knowledge and my uh, child has enough knowledge about himself that um and we have the tools so he doesn't have to um, have that intervention anymore. I like that you're saying like kind of live in the season and see what your kid needs in that season. And when you were in an early intervention age range with your children and were studying um, what therapy could look like and you were with your spouse able to say like, maybe I'll stop working and we'll go for this intensive approach. The STAR Institute does have an intensive model. And what that looks like very practically for parents who are listening is that the children would come to STAR once, depending on their age, sometimes twice a day for a period of time that's more like three to six weeks instead of once a week for six months. But there's also a place for the one to two times a week, depending on the season of life you're in. If you're working on a specific goal or really want to accomplish something, sometimes the intensive model can help get you there quicker. But if you're looking to maintain, sometimes the once a week model can be really helpful to you. One thing I heard that impacted you the most in experiencing all the different ways you've experienced intervention was being included as a parent. So tell me a little bit, I know you've had both experiences where you were not in the clinic and then you've had the experience that you've been in the clinic and tell me a little bit about those experiences. You know, and I, I have thought about that a lot and I was like, you do, you meet the child where they are, but you also kind of meet the parent where they are. Cause sometimes you might be overwhelmed and the parent just cannot like, you know, um, be present there. Um, I think for me, it was very empowering when our, the o, our OT in Georgia and um, she brought me in, in the sessions and just had me sit on a couch, um, and kind of watch what was going on. And then sent, she actually sent the soap notes home with me, which is the occupational therapy notes from the session. And like, I just kind of collected them and she'd given me things like resources and they kind of, you know, she was just kind of, I think she was kind of meeting me where I was at. And then a couple few months in, I started talking to her and like, um, you know, then I started doing the, um, more at home, like carryover. where she'd say, do this. And that would be like, okay. And then I, like was like, I'm going to go to the star symposium because I can learn a lot and do that at home because, um, you know, the, the therapist has them like, even at an intensive model, three, three hours a week was what like one therapist would do, but I'm with my children the remainder of the time. And so, um, that's how she included me. Our, um, our physical therapist that was amazing. She, she would, um, um, either have me watch or like she even had like my one of my my youngest like swing me around and like kind of use me as like therapeutic heavy work <laughs> and then she would capture on video and then text me and give a little snippet like you know this is what like we were working on and like this is how it helped um Gabriel and and then that would remind me and I could look back on my phone at any time, but, you know, because like, especially a mom of two that were toddlers, like I could look at that and say, okay, well, maybe we can replicate that. Like, and she would use like things that you would have at your home or give you suggestions. So, um, you know, at, it was just really empowering. And like, I enjoyed going to those sessions. There was a period of time, even with her, where it was like, okay, he does better now without me being in there, but having had several sessions or months there was so um, great to gain that knowledge as a mom. And then he went off and did it on his own. I love the word that you used empowering because it really, if you meet the parent where they're at, they're going to feel empowered. Um, and it's such an important piece of it. It doesn't have to look one way, right? It can look however the parent and the therapist, um, you know, decide it's going to look. And, you know, you can say sometimes, I think he's going to do better without me today. Or you can say, Hey, I'm going to, I'd love to come in, <laughs> you know, and could you videotape some ideas for me? So from both a parent perspective and from an interventionist perspective, all of that sounds great. I think there's something to be learned for everybody there. 
I um, feel like I could talk to you about this forever because I just appreciate your perspective so much. And I appreciate the way that you went all in. You found out about this for your children and um, got curious about what it could mean for them. But then you started just learning and learning and learning and that uh, ended up going to state classes and go to the symposium. And then you just followed your curiosity and your passion. And here you are um, with, you know, your boys being seven and nine now back at work full time, which at one time didn't feel like it was going to be available to you and serving as president of the board of directors at the Star Institute. So it's just a, such an inspiring story of going from a really concerned mom to a place where you have knowledge and tools that have really, really impacted your family. And now you're turning around and sharing it with other people. So it's super inspiring to me. And I know so many people listening will, will feel that. Well, thank you. So let's, um, I want to ask you the same question that I got to ask Jared earlier um, in terms of what's something that you once believed um, that you've changed your mind about. And probably like Jared, I've kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but I would say like a, a good involved parent knows their child best. You know, you spend more time than any medical professional or therapist with them. And I learned that you really have to advocate and find, find the fit for your child. If it's a good fit or an ill fit and like refuse those ill-fitted relationships, like you would a normal friendship. There was a time when I was like, I just want him to be in therapy. And we were at a place that really was, he was regressing. It was such an ill fit. Um, and it doesn't necessarily always speak to the therapist, but it's that relationship because your child may need a different therapist for whatever reason, especially if there's these additional needs, like maybe it's just not meshing in whatever way, but don't be afraid to be like, okay, I need to step away and find a good fit. Um, and that may mean not having therapy for a couple of months or a month or whatever, um, you know, um, but really advocate and, and get involved and know the, know the professionals that are seeing your, your child and kind of, um, just pick up on if, if they're progressing, like you would hope, um, or if they're regressing, uh, and there's going to be regression even in good therapy, but overall, <laughs> yeah, thank you for saying that because I do think. That's one thing I like to give parents permission to do is A, be the expert in their child and B, have a voice in whether or not this is a good fit and build a team around your child that has all the ingredients of good relationship that are going to support your child's progression and know that it's okay to say, this isn't a good fit. We're going to go find some, something that is a good fit. So thank you for saying that. I really appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for all that you do for STAR and on the board of directors, but also um, in the way that you share the message of um, sensory processing and sensory health and wellness, um, that the way that you turn around to other people and offer your story as a beacon of hope to them um, and as an inspiration to them um, that you poured into your family and the result is that you learned a tremendous amount about who they are and can love them better um, as who they are. So it's very, very important um, for parents and interventionists alike to hear these personal stories. And so I appreciate your vulnerability in sharing it today. Well, thank you, Harry. I really appreciate your time. You can find me, Carrie Schmidt, on Instagram at Carrie Schmidt OTD. That's C A R R I E S C H M I T T O T D. The Star Institute is a nonprofit organization. You can find out more about us at our website, sensoryhealth.org. That's S E N S O R Y H E A L T H dot org. There, you can join our email list. Find out about our educational, clinical, and research endeavors and make a donation. This podcast wouldn't be possible without our wonderful guests and the support from the Star Institute. Your feedback matters to us. Please leave us a review, subscribe to this podcast, 
and share this episode with your friends. This is Making Sense. I'm Carrie Schmidt.